Um, I'm Fiona Crawford. It is my distinct honour and privilege to be the President and CEO of the Ross Kemp Institute. I'm here today just to kick things off, just to welcome you, give you a little bit of an introduction to the Institute, and then I'm going to be handing over to some of the other members of our team here who are going to talk you through some of the work that is ongoing at the Ross Kemp Institute. So I think some of you have been here before, some of you maybe have not, so I'll just give a little bit of background. We've been here at this site since 2003. Uh, Bob Roskamp and his wife bought this building for us and donated it to us. So we own this building and uh, it used to be an old Bosch and Lom facility actually and we've remodelled it and if you go on the tours later you'll see that uh, we did quite a lot of extensive remodelling and we have an amazing setup now of our clinic and our laboratories. We have about 60 staff that includes clinicians, scientists, PhD students. We have a PhD program here at Ross Camp. We have research assistants, our administrative staff, our facilities staff, and we also have interns and students coming to us from all of the nearby universities and colleges. They come and they spend sometimes months here, sometimes they stay here, sometimes they end up getting jobs here and staying with us, and sometimes they join our PhD program. So we're really uh, building into the community here in the Manatee, Sarasota area. Our research is focused on finding treatments and better diagnostics for neurodegenerative and neuropsychiatric disorders. And you're going to hear a lot about that today. But I just want to give you a sort of big picture overview of why the Ross Camp Institute is different. I think, I think you're going to see that today. I think you'll feel it when you talk with our scientists and clinicians and tour our facilities. But we have a multidisciplinary and an integrated approach to what we do here. And what I mean by that is everybody talks to everybody else. That's really the bottom line. We don't have a situation where Daniel is in his lab over here and he doesn't communicate with Chow in chemistry. Gany is working over there and the only time anybody sees anybody is whenever we all come together to do an event like this. We're all communicating all the time about our research. And we run things on a project basis, not an individual team leader basis. It's a project basis. So that means if we have a particular project on post-traumatic stress disorder, we bring together around the table, we bring together the necessary people in our team and collaborators from outside to make that project work so that we have all the right people around the table, all the right people talking about how we need to run the project and how we need to, to make that work. And that's a very different approach. It's not siloed in any way. It really is interconnected. It means we can move fast. It means we're very, very collaborative. And it means we get deliverables. That's the bottom line. We get deliverables and we get them quickly. Our funding, as I think many of you know, comes from the Veterans Administration, from the Department of Defence, from the National Institutes of Health, the Alzheimer's Association. We also have public-private partnerships. And, uh, and of course, we have philanthropic gifts from folks like you and others in our community here. And then we have a standing gift from the Roskam Foundation every year. And I do want to specifically mention that, because without that, which contributes about a, a, a fifth or a sixth of our budget, we wouldn't be able to do as much as we're doing here. We wouldn't be able to do the discovery work. And what I mean by that is that whenever we apply for grants and funding to the Veterans Administration and to, to the Department of Defense, there's a particular project outlined. And we essentially have to follow that project. We have an hypothesis, we have aims, we have goals and deliverables. And we can, we can vary off track a bit as our, as our work proceeds and as the data come in, we can change direction. But we still essentially follow the, the message of that original grant application. When we find something new in the labs, which we do on a very regular basis, we may find something that's really interesting that we want to pursue. And it's the funding from the Ross Camp Foundation so-called the discretionary money that enables us 
to actually pursue those new findings and explore just to see, is there anything there? Is this something I should be taking a look at? And so we can generate pilot data, and then we use that to come back and fund, fund our research programs. We also have a contract research organization. You'll see a sign on the wall there for SRQ Bio, and you'll hear a little bit about that today. SRQ Bio is a contract research organization that provides resources and support and research for folks who want to make use of the expertise, the knowledge and the facilities that we have here and don't have those resources themselves. So we can, we can run uh, analyses on blood samples from clinical trials, for example, and we can run research projects when folks think that they might have something that's a novel approach for Alzheimer's disease. And the point of that is that that further brings money back in to feed the research. So we basically do molecular neuroscience here. That's probably the, the term I use if people ask, what, what do we do? What are you? I'll probably say I'm a neuroscientist. We look at a molecular level at the problems that are happening in the conditions that we work on. And there's four that you're going to hear mostly about today. We're focusing on problems that we work on that really are issues for veterans and, and the military and their families. Alzheimer's disease, traumatic brain injury, Gulf War illness, and post-traumatic stress disorder. We want to identify targets that we'll be able to go after to treat the conditions, and we want to identify better ways to diagnose these conditions. One of the things that I'm sure you're very aware of is that for conditions such as PTSD or Gulf War illness, it's very difficult when you go to see the doctor, maybe you go to the VA and they say, well, there's no such thing as Gulf War illness or you haven't got PTSD. If there was actually a biomarker, for example, something in your blood that you could measure that clinicians recognized as meaning that you had PTSD or Gulf War illness, that would change things dramatically in terms of your treatment, in terms of your ability to get compensation for those conditions, it would really be, be transforming. So we're working on those issues as well. I have the picture of the mouse there because, I think that's Jerry, isn't it? That's Tom and Jerry. Um, it's better than putting a picture of a real mouse there, but you will see the mice later. They're, they're all getting ready to see you. Um, <laughs> I always have to say something about mice because so much of our work involves work with mouse models. And there's a reason for that, so I always have to give my caveat. If we could do the work we do with cells in a Petri dish, or just with, with flasks, just, just working in, in test tubes and microscopes. You know, we would do what we do without using mice if it were possible, but it's not. And there's a very simple reason for that. And the simple reason is the complexity of the human brain. There is as yet no way to model the complexity of the human brain in a Petri dish. So we can look at human neurons and see how they respond to particular treatments or insults. We can look at all sorts of other different cell types. We can even put different cell types together in a Petri dish, and then we know that we're getting the signaling that maybe goes from astrocytes to neurons or whatever the complex mixture is that we put in there. But it does not model the complexity of the connections and the responses that happen between all the different cell types and all the architecture of the brain. So for that reason, we do have to use animal models, and we use mice. And we use mice for several reasons. Uh, we use mice because they're relatively cheap. We use mice because there are a lot of different genetically modified mice available, and sometimes we want to know what happens if we look at mice that are predisposed to Alzheimer's disease in the same way that humans can be predisposed to Alzheimer's disease. There's also another reason, which is that if you put a male mouse and a female mouse together, next thing you've got about 40, uh, so that helps too. <laughs> and the lifespan of a mouse, in the lab it's typically two to three years, so we can actually look at the entire lifespan of a mouse within a reasonable time frame in our projects. So for example, you're going to hear later from Dr. Muzon talking about our TBI research. And he has done something which no other research team had done before him. He gave mice head injury and then looked at the consequences across the entire lifespan. So the mice were injured when they were young, maybe army age, you know, just, just signed up, just deployed. And then they didn't have any other injuries 
But he followed them and he looked at them and he analyzed them over time, all the way through to two years after those injuries. And I tell you, his data are rather scary, but they also show us that those are good models for the chronic effects of neurotrauma, which is, of course, one of the key things that we now know to be a major problem for traumatic brain injury in humans. So you're going to hear a lot about this today. I'll just outline the sorts of things we look at. We do behavioral studies in the mice. We look at uh, whether or not they can find their way out of a maze, how they respond to potentially anxiety-provoking situations, how they interact with other mice. We're trying to develop more tools that might be able to detect some of the more mood and behavioral aspects of mice, things that might be more subtle, things that might relate to conditions such as post-traumatic stress disorder or depression. We also look at the brain biochemistry and the blood biochemistry, and you'll see with Dr. Abdullah and, and Evans in the mass spectrometry lab how we can take very complex mixtures and we can identify hundreds and thousands of proteins and lipids from those samples and see how they change whenever there's a disease versus a control situation. And we also do neuropathological analyses where we look at the brains of our mice and through our clinical collaborators, we look to see do our mouse models really reflect what we see in humans? Because there's no point in our mouse models unless they do adequately recapitulate some of the features of human disease. And then at the end of the day, of course, what we're trying to do is find treatments and diagnostics. So once we can cure the mice, that's a step. Doesn't mean we're there yet, but if we were able to cure our mouse models, it's a step towards having a treatment that we can test in human clinical settings. So I'm going to say just a few words about nilvadipine. This is our Alzheimer's drug, which is currently in a clinical trial in Europe. And all of our preclinical research here showed that nilvadipine would have potential as a treatment for Alzheimer's disease. It blocks the buildup of the protein amyloid that causes the amyloid plaques in the brain. It also increases the clearance of amyloid out of the brain into the blood gets it out of there so that it's not causing the problems anymore. It reduces inflammation in the brain, and it also reduces phosphorylation of a protein called tau, which forms the neurofibrillary tangles in Alzheimer's disease. So it's all of those things. So we're actually very optimistic about nilvadipine because it does so many different things. Many of the treatments that have been tried for Alzheimer's disease have really focused on a single aspect of the disease. And we now know that that's really unlikely to be very helpful. One reason being that by the time folks start to show signs of Alzheimer's, they've actually had problems going on in their brain for many, many years. So we need to tackle not just the initiating factor, but everything that came after. So we've, we've a trial ongoing in Europe, nine different countries, uh, eight different languages. I can tell you that's been amusing. Um, and I know there's been a few other things happening this week, but something very exciting happened on Monday. It was the last visit for the last patient. So patient 510 in the NILVAD trial had their final visit in Dublin, Ireland on Monday. So now the databases are closed and all of the analyses starts. And we expect to have the results of our trial early next year. Fingers crossed. Thank you. I just had to put this up. Um, I found it on the internet literally yesterday. This is a poster that was hanging on my bedroom wall all the way through my childhood. Uh, my mum had got it for me. I think clearly she was trying to get me to focus more at school or <laughs> become a scientist maybe, I don't know. But I thought it really spoke to the mission of the Institute here. We are very mission driven here at the Institute. I heard this term. Uh, from the secretary of the VA on Monday at a meeting in Washington that I was attending. And I thought, because he's trying to make the VA more mission-driven rather than rules-driven, which I welcome, and I'm sure all veterans would welcome. And I heard him talking, I spoke to him afterwards, and I said, you know, our, our institute's always been mission-driven. And he said, well, that's great. And here's the team, here's the mission-driven team. Everybody here has dedicated their lives to trying to tackle these human conditions that cause so much suffering. And you're going to hear that today. We're going to have some talks from our clinicians, 
about how they treat the disease, how we address it in the clinic and some of the clinical trials we have ongoing. Then some of our researchers are going to describe the preclinical work, the work we do in animals and cell culture models. And then we're going to, if you, if you want, then we'll take you around the facility and you'll actually see the labs and see what folks do in the labs and how we get to our deliverables that we present to you at the end of the day. So that's my introduction. And with that, I want to again welcome you all. Thank you all for coming. We are delighted to have this opportunity to honor the men and women who have served and continue to serve our country. And I'm going to hand over to Dr. Keegan, who is the director of the Ross Camp Clinic. Thank you very much. I'm a, I'm a neurologist and we have the clinic and you'll note on the tour, it's kind of on the bottom of the list because it's really not very interesting to look at. It's all this fancy equipment you see in the back. Uh, so I really uh, would encourage you to go on the tour. Um, so, but as a neurologist, we are hopefully at the point where we're gonna be dealing with the deliverables. These things that we're trying to come up with that the scientists are trying to discover will eventually be tested in the clinic. And that's kind of the overview that I wanna give you of the clinic. Uh, so there's kind of three components you'll see. Uh, and we're involved in the patient care as well as the pharmaceutical trials and then the integration with the clinical trial or preclinical research uh, here in the that the scientists in the back are working on. So that's kind of the overview. Regarding patient care, we see people with Alzheimer's dementia as a neurologist. We're people that will evaluate these diseases. We'll have patients come in. We'll try to sort out if they're having memory complaints, what's the cause of that memory complaints. But we'll also treat and evaluate people with traumatic brain injury, as well as Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, and goal for illness, which you'll hear Dr. Hoffman discuss. Um, and then people may come in with various complaints. They may feel that their arm is numb or tingling. We're trying to sort out maybe they have carpal tunnel or if they have multiple sclerosis or something coming from their neck. So that's what we do as clinicians on the patient care side. I'm gonna discuss Alzheimer's in general. So Alzheimer's disease as we know is a very common disease. Um, we're talking about over 5 million people in the United States with Alzheimer's dementia. And the number, when you're looking at 65 and older, it's considered to be one in nine. And some of the key risk factors for Alzheimer's dementia, number one is age, so that's why it's very common in this geography, as well as family history, which includes genetics, and then, of course, other risk factors which are seen in the military, such as head trauma. So that area is also, you'll hear some discussions later, again, where the integration of maybe a known disease, something like Alzheimer's dementia, or at least we think we know things about that disease, how it integrates with something like traumatic brain injury, how can you look at a scientific level, at the molecular level, at trying to understand that integration that I think Roskamp is really unique in, in looking at that. Um, so the clinical presentation of Alzheimer's dementia is usually one of forgetfulness, repeating things, losing language, and then having trouble with planning, such as coming to an event like this, maybe forgetting that it's on your calendar or navigating your way here, getting lost on your way here. These are clinical ways of presenting with Alzheimer's, but we'll be, as in the, in the clinic, we'll look at hearing that history, trying to assess that, getting blood work to try to figure out what could be causing it, such as something like a B12 deficiency or a thyroid abnormality, but then we'll also do imaging. I'm gonna show you a picture here of uh, the hippocampus. Um, we're, we, we're gonna talk about a little bit about amyloid, but the hippocampus is one of those areas of the brain we see some atrophy. So on the top slide, we see a young patient, and I want you to focus in on this area where the yellow line is pointing to. As it becomes aged, you'll start to see atrophy, mild cognitive impairment, so that's before someone developed Alzheimer's, and then mild Alzheimer's dementia. So with time, you'll see that hippocampus is full and then it slowly shrinks down. So that's one of the ways in the clinic we can hear the history of decline in memory and thinking. We'll do an MRI to try to help us 
determine if that person may have Alzheimer's dementia, but the MRI itself doesn't make the diagnosis. The MRI just gives us some more information. It rules out some other causes. Another method of imaging we use is a PET scan. And here you can see the difference between the two, uh, two slides. The one on the left is a control, a healthy, normal person, similar age, and then the right is an Alzheimer's dementia. And you can see that reduction in color. Now this is not a structural image. This is more of a functional image. So you're looking how glucose is being metabolized. So you can use that also to assess someone with memory and thinking decline. But ultimately, I think Dr. Crawford alluded to what is kind of what is the underlying pathology. She referred to nilvatapine affecting these things, amyloid and tau. Here's just a cartoon of the amyloid plaque and the tau that's within the cells. Ultimately, you want treatments that are kind of going after that, but also you need to have methods of finding that or measuring it. So one way we can have a patient come in and do a spinal tap, usually they're not as keen on doing that, but it's really not as bad of a procedure, at least when I'm performing them, it doesn't seem like the patients are <laughs> complaining too much about it. Um, but you know that's a, a method of measuring it. And then now we have imaging techniques. They're not quite ready for prime time or they're, they're FDA approved, but not used on a regular basis, but are part of the clinical trial. So this is the first version. It was called PIB and it looks at amyloid and you can see the color changes from a healthy subject to somebody with Alzheimer's dementia. So here we have a method of looking at the pathology in the brain from the outside and then you can then use that to track people that are in clinical trials. So I've been in practice for about 13 years. The treatments we have right now for Alzheimer's include some acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. So these medicines provide a little more acetylcholine. Their Aricet is probably the one that's been around the longest. Exelon is one that comes in a patch. And then there's Nemenda. So these have been approved for quite a long time. You'll see that's 2003 since the last drug has been approved. 2003. There's been like 210 trials or more without finding good results. And so we're hopeful or curious about how nilvatapine does because that drug also goes at that, again, they're going after tau, inflammation, amyloid, which we think are key components. There are also other trials. So in that first slide I showed you, we're involved in treating patients and evaluating patients, but we're also involved in clinical trials. So we have pharmaceutical companies that approach us and say, hey, we need to study a thousand people with Alzheimer's dementia. Perhaps you can study five or 10 of them here. And so we'll get involved in those clinical trials. So one that kind of made the news recently is uh, one that we're not actually involved with, but we're involved with a couple others. But this slide shows on the left, it shows patients at baseline. And if you remember that picture looking at amyloid, this is another method of looking at amyloid. So these patients all have amyloid in their brain. With time, after one year, with the placebo, there was really no change. But with different doses of this medication, they were actually able to remove amyloid from the brain. So these are ideas that are in phase two, phase three trials. These are kind of getting closer to completing to try to see if there's actually a result that will affect the patient clinically. Because you may be able to pull out amyloid in the brain and reduce tau. The question is, does that slow the disease itself down? Does that make a clinical response that's beneficial? And that's why, as, as uh, Dr. Crawford was referring to, ultimately you have to find out at the end of the day, is it working in the clinic? So that's one of the uh, clinical trials. We're also involved with clinical trials, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, mild cognitive impairment. And then that third component is that kind of idea of interfacing with the scientists. And that is so true here. I go in the back and I eat lunch with the scientists. We meet periodically. There's a journal club on Friday. So these are the things that make this place very unique and interesting to me. And that the goal at the end of the day is to try to come up with something that can be helpful for a diagnosis or helpful for a treatment. And we have a study that uh, we've just uh, received IRB approval for this trial, and this isn't a treatment trial, so this is more of a diagnostic trial. So people that went to Gulf, were in the Gulf War, 
some of them develop a Gulf War syndrome or illness. And Dr. Hoffman's going to kind of go over that. Right now, we're collecting blood samples, or we're about to embark on collecting blood samples of patients who have Gulf War syndrome and those that went to the Gulf War and haven't developed a syndrome. They come in for one visit. They provide a sample of blood. They do some questionnaires, some memory testing, and then those blood samples are evaluated by the basic scientists for things that they may find that are related to the disorder. And then that can help think about what would be the next target, what would be the next way of approaching a treatment. So this is kind of a perfect example of how Roskamp has that combination of the basic translational science with the clinic, how we work together on a project. And you'll hear more about that a little bit later about the basic science. So that's just an overview of the clinic. Again, make sure you go on the tour and see the fancy stuff, and you'll just stand at the door for the clinic itself. So thank you all for coming. And next will be uh, Dr. Hoffman talking about Gulf War. Good morning. Welcome, everybody. And, and uh, thank you for the invitation to Fiona and Andy. Um, you've already seen my slideshow. <laughs> but um, just a few points. Um, what has been happening in, in the major war illness categories, which is TBI, Gulf War illness, PTSD, and other conditions like uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy? Um, can you hear me? This better? Oh, sorry. So there's been many clinical advances in various ways, and one of them is our understanding of how the human brain was constructed. So there's a lot of um, other disciplines that we need to speak to, we need to read about, and it becomes very, very complex because there's, there's perhaps a dozen, two dozen disciplines, and one of them is uh, neuroarchaeological literature. And that tells us that the brain was constructed in a certain way. And one of the most important things about that is we've We've come away from this business of the brain having certain parts, like you see on your left picture. There's 52 different areas of the brain, which is the Brodmann area of the uh, brain map. Um, there's a part for speech, a part for movement, and a part for thinking and memory. It's much more a network. And this is a modern uh, network image on, on your right-hand side. And you may be surprised to know that if you added all your brain fibers together, it would amount to 100,000 miles inside of your head, which is four times around the planet. And one of the consequences of that, so we have this mass of nerve fibers network in our brain, is that it can be injured very, very easily. So these are very microscopic fibers, if you like. And there's certain areas in the brain that are more likely to be injured than others. And the most important ones just happen to be the temporal lobes and the frontal lobes, which you can see over here. So these areas where these dark circles are, are drawn, these are the areas that are most injured in the brain, no matter what kind of brain injury you have. And this is very, very important because these are so-called silent areas in our brain. They're silent to our testing and the clinic to neuropsychological tests, they're even silent to a lot of brain imaging. And hence the problem that we have, that many of you know you've got a problem, but the doctors say, no, well, we can't find anything wrong with you. This is part of the issue. So which are the other silent uh, syndromes that we're speaking about? Um, a lot of them are frontotemporal because these are the areas most injured. There's a frontotemporal of dementia, for example, which has only recently become a, a talking matter because it, it was basically ignored for a hundred years. And now it's one of the most common dementias we know about. And then there's of course CTE, which is chronic traumatic encephalopathy, all those people who are prone to recurrent concussions, and I'm talking about the sporting world in particular. And then we have um, the traumatic brain injury um, syndromes, which particularly pertain to the um, operation enduring freedom, etc., and then of course toxic wounds, which are the, the Gulf War illness syndromes. And just to go back to one of the, the facts in neurobiology, one thing that distinguishes our brain from mice is we have a lot more association cortex, 
And one thing that distinguishes us from primates um, is that we have a much, much bigger brain. It increased uh, threefold. But even more so is our network, our fiber networks increased much, much more than even the brain size. And I've already shown you we have 100,000 miles of that. And if you look at comparison studies of, of apes and, and humans, the most important um, brain areas um, in red here, it's called the uncinate fasciculus, bit of a tongue twister, but this is the most important fiber tract, you, you may say, that makes us humans. And when this becomes disrupted, we, we, we're no longer human. And that's something you see with things like frontotemporal lobe dementias. And the areas in green here are the comparison studies between um, apes and our brain. Um, this is the major language network. It's called the arcuate fasciculus. So you can see that these have dramatically increased in size as opposed to primates. And of course, mice don't even have these fiber tracts. Now, one important consequence is the, you all have heard about computers having an operating system which drives everything else. <clears throat> if your operating system is slow, all the programs you load on it don't function well at all, if at all. And ours is called working memory. So this is something, if I give you a telephone number, for example, you have to keep it in your head long enough to dial the number. That is working memory in its simplest form. But it also allows us um, to speak, to think about what we're saying next, etc. And that is depicted in these yellow and red areas in the brain. These, it's an extensive brain network area that's, that um, uh, is the, the basis of our working memory. And the fiber tracts in green are the ones that are disrupted with traumatic brain injury. So you can see that when you have traumatic brain injury, the network between all these important areas that subserve our operating system are then impaired. And you need very fancy scans to show this. Um, you cannot see it on normal MRI scans. This is a picture of the protein accumulation which is deleterious in people that have recurrent brain injury, such as football players, for example. And we now call the syndrome chronic traumatic encephalopathy. This is an, a dementia that can begin in your, in your 30s. And even college kids and even school kids um, suffer from uh, recurrent traumatic brain injury syndromes when their head is shaken, for example, during collisions, whether it's ice hockey playing or football, and you have effects, and you'll hear much more from our scientists about just how bad those effects can be. Now, one of the reasons why TBI and Gulf War illness is difficult to diagnose is probably because the lesion is at a molecular level. It's microscopic. You cannot see any abnormality on our fancy brain scans. And a recent statement um, paper in a very prominent journal called Cortex, and Fiona Crawford was one of the authors, um, basically set out um, our current knowledge about Gulf War illness. Um, and it's a very, very good paper, and it labels it as a neurological and not a psychiatric illness and there's certain criteria, there's about three different groups that have criteria for diagnosis, and one of them is the Haley criteria. And you can see that it includes cognitive, um, joint pains, muscle pains, um, endocrine, all sorts of different syndromes that you can suffer from. And of course, this leads you to all kinds of different disciplines. And it's very difficult then for the doctors to put it together that this is all due to one reason, which is a toxic wound. Basically, the, the poisons you were given to uh, prevent you from, from suffering from nerve gas poisoning. And it also happens to, this kind of injury also happens to affect those fiber tracts that I mentioned that are so important in the human brain. There are 100,000 miles of them. And here's some pretty pictures of the principal fiber tracts in our brain, the major networks, the major interstates, if you like, of our brain. Um, I've already mentioned some of them, like the one in red, the uncinate fasciculus, which is social and character and behavioral things. That's what it subserves, and the one for language. And we can now image these fiber tracts with special MRI equipment. And we can start tracking whether they are healthy, whether they're diseased, whether they're recovering, and we've seen all those kind of things. 
And of course, um, this particular unsnit fasciculus is one that is uh, probably damaged most in uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Now with Gulf War illness, the lesion seems to be at another microscopic level at the synapse. So particular synaptic proteins, and we won't go into all these different names here because the, the scientists will tell you about that, uh, but one or more of these proteins is damaged. And this is a, a tiny little vesicle which, um, which sends a neurotransmitter from one brain cell to another. And of course, there's tens of thousands of these re released in microseconds. And the proteins that are part of this vesicle are, are damaged in toxic wounds, i.e. Gulf War illness. So this kind of injury at a microscopic level can damage different tissues, not only your brain, but your nerves, your muscles, and your endocrine organs. And then we have pretty new information about the different kind of injury that may result from blast injuries. So if some blunt object hits your head, you can suffer a particular kind of brain injury, but there's a different kind of brain injury when a shock wave hits you, and these are characteristic of um, the IED blasts that we so commonly hear about. And the, the shock wave literally rattles the brain inside the, the intact skull and causes this microscopic shearing of nerve fiber tracts. And also the proteins that hold the little synapses together. The synapses are the, the junctions between two nerve fibers that transmit information in your head. So we can call this a synaptopathy, again, a microscopic lesion in the brain. And some new animal data that I found particularly interesting, um, mice subjected to blast-type injuries that had PTSD-like and TBI-like injuries. They had reduction in, in spatial learning. And interestingly, none of these changes were seen on the MRI scans. So you see we need new equipment to uh, be able to measure and, and track these changes. This is a, a, a nice diagram of the, diff the comp complexity at the synapse, which is the junction between two nerve fibers, the proteins that are disrupted with blast injury. There's no way that you can see this on any of our fancy brain scans. Maybe new network analysis scans, which I'll mention very briefly in a minute, um, may give us the answer. And you can see here, these proteins are disrupted. This is what they should look like before injury, and this is what they look like after injury. Now, one of the things that happens in the human brain when it's stressed, no matter what kind of stressor you have, is that the frontal cortex, which is in blue and green, it's kind of the executive part of your brain, that controls everything else. If there's too much stress, this thing shuts down and you are then guided in your decision making by more basal circuitry such as the amygdala. It's a very, very important philosophical understanding that you then are subject to not so much thinking about how you act, you just act on, on impulse if you like. And that's a very, very important understanding of what happens when the brain is stressed in any particular way. Now we've made some major strides in imaging. Diffusion tensor imaging is a, a method that can image the fiber tracts that are injured. Metabolic imaging is by PET scan that shows you how active certain parts of the brain are or not. And then what looks to be most promising is called intrinsic functional connectivity. Again, a tongue twist, I'm sorry about that, but this is a kind of network imaging that the MRI brain scanners are able to do. And very briefly, I want to just mention some new thinking about what kinds of treatment may work for people with these various uh, silent lesions and Gulf War illness, TBI, et cetera, PTSD. Um, Prazosin is one drug that's been shown to be helpful with um, PTSD. A lot of uh, stimulant drugs like dopaminergic drugs have been shown to be effective <coughs> for TBI, but pharmacotherapy is not the answer. It can help some of the symptoms of, that people may have, but much more important it would be to perhaps get at the root cause of the problem, try and fix what went wrong. And we can do this with certain diets, for example, 
particularly high seafood diets, DHA-based diets, fish oil, ketogenic diets, mitochondrial cocktails, um, and then other things that help the brain rewire, such as meditation. And I'll show you a, a study about that. Then magnetic stimulation to the brain is helpful in various disorders, including frontotemporal lobe dementias. This is a study that I found that was very interesting, giving you a um, biochemical approach to TBI and how increasing your DHA, which is the um, omega-3 fatty acid, is probably helpful. And then don't forget there's many other forms of therapy, such as music therapy, visual art therapy, literary art therapy. These are all stimulant approaches to the mind. There's an interesting group in, in Orlando who are represented by Terry today, neuroplasticity, who also use stimulant therapy. Uh, they have various uh, gadgets and equipment, and they're looking to stimulate the mind of people with traumatic brain injury to see if, if that would be effective. Performing art therapy, forest therapy, uh, pioneered by the Japanese, for example, and of course, pet and animal assisted therapy are all approaches. Musicality in the brain is, is a, has a very interesting history. You can literally transform people with Parkinson's and Alzheimer's from being almost immobile to dancing around on the floor just by giving a music therapy. So this is a very, very powerful tool if used correctly. And this was a project recently published about how important it is to sometimes paint your thoughts and feelings and when words are not enough. And my final uh, slide is on the effects of meditation in the brain. The areas in color are those areas that rewire themselves, the most important ones for the very diseases we study in response to properly uh, managed meditation therapy. So these are just some thoughts for you that there's a lot going out, uh, on out there and there's a lot we can do and it's not just drug therapy. Drug therapy is important but there's a lot more as well. Thank you very much. A question? Yeah, sure we can have one or two questions. Pardon? Will you repeat the question, what she said? Yes, I will. No, this would be in general. Um, I don't think uh, a, a stressor like traumatic brain injury can distinguish it between synapses. But, and they may, of course, be affected to, the, to a different degree. So the question was, you know, are different synapses affected uh, according to which neurotransmitter? Before I get started, I just want to thank you all for giving us the, the opportunity to share with you our work. So I'm going to talk about the goal for uh, illness, and I'm going to focus uh, specifically on uh, the work we're doing in uh, mass model, developing a mass model. First, before I get started, I just want to remind you that about one-fourth of the veterans that were deployed during the Gulf War, when they came back, start, you know, developing symptoms and w that we call now Gulf War illness. And the symptoms are, it's a plethora of symptoms. And let me, uh, so there's several f symptoms like fatigue, persistent headache, muscle, neurological symptom, uh, sleep disorder, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, gastrointestinal symptom, etc., and you can have a few symptom, all of the symptom, one symptom. So that's why it makes it really, really hard to understand uh, what's going on in uh, Gulf War illness. So the first thing we wanted to do is basically for us to understand the uh, Gulf War illness is develop a symptom. Um, so the causes what was thought to cause the uh, Gulf for illness, there was several things that w were suggested, such as organophosphate, chemical pesticide, pyridostigmine uh, bromide, which is an acetylcholine inhibitor that was used uh, to protect against a uh, nerve agent. Uh, 
um, they received the multiple vaccines, sometimes up to you know 17 vaccines before they got deploy deployed. Uh, depleted, they were exposed to depleted uranium, uh, oil, fire, uh, fume, and all that. But at the end, it was agreed that the the two component that were the most important in basically causing the disease was pyristigmine bromide and permeth permethrin. But there is other stuff. But we focus mainly on permethrin and uh, pyristigmine bromide to develop our model. So the first thing we, we wanted to do is uh, develop a model that mimics Gulf War illness if we want to study uh, Gulf War illness. So what we did is expose mice to pyridistigmine bromide and permethrin for 10 days, basically mimicking you know, the, the period of the war. It was really short, although the, you know, the, the war lasted, but you know, the, the, it was shorter. So then we, what we did is basically follow these mice, expose them for 10 days, and follow them over time from 11 day to 22 uh, and a half months, basically, after exposure, which is almost a lifetime of a mouse. Then we do uh, examine them to see uh, if there is any uh, neurobehavior deficit. We do other uh, testing as well to measure fatigue, stress, uh, and other things. And then we, once we are done with the, beha uh, the behavior testing, and we establish that there is some deficiency, we look at then what happens inside the brain. And to do that, we did a global proteomic because we don't know what's happening in the brain. So we started looking at the whole brain, what's happening uh, at uh, the protein level. Then we, uh, in one of the study, we did a treatment strategy and see if we improve uh, those deficiency. I'm going to focus mainly on uh, learning and memory because obviously the Roskamp Institute is mainly focused on the brain. So one of the tests we do is called uh, Barnes Maze. Basically, it's an open platform with different holes, and in one of the holes, we have an escape box. And usually, uh, mice don't like open space. They like confined space. They like to be in the dark. So what we do, we put them in the middle of the maze, and basically show, you know, teach them where is the escape box uh, initially. And to help them learn, we, uh, there is, you know, cues in the wall of the room. And, you know, we give them stressor in a way. Basically bright light, L mice don't like bright lights. Then we have a fan that's going on in the room. So those are all stressors that will basically encourage the mice to find the escape box. We do that for four days, and on the fifth day, what we do, we remove the escape box and subject them to the same test and see if they learn where the escape box was. We're going to subject them to the same stress and see what happens if they know where the escape box was. So this is some of the data of the different group we tested. As you can see, this is the, the, the distance traveled for mice to go to that area where the escape box was. And this is just a control mice that was not expo exposed to Gulf War agent. And this is a mice, a group of mice actually, that were exposed to uh, Gulf War agent. And as you can see, five months after the 10 day exposure, the mice doesn't remember what the escape box is. Again, we followed them, you know, another group at 15 months, we see the same trend. 16 months, we see the same trend. At, at 22 months post-exposure, we didn't see much, but I think that's due to the fact that, you know, <coughs> what mice is 25 uh, months old, so she's really old or he's a really old, um, you know, the old mice. So basically the age, age effect masked the effect of the exposure. Then when we look at uh, the brain, what's going on, this is a control mice in this uh, panel, and this panel is the exposed mice. And what you can see, all these brown dots, and this is just the same image, just uh, uh, you know, larger. Basically, what you see is basically this brown dot. Those are astrocyte, and astrocyte basically the, one of their role in the brain is to fight insults in the brain. Basically, if it, it fights insult, it's a good thing. But then, if 
to fight that, they get activated, what we call astrogliosis. They get activated, they, sh uh, they change shape, they become you know, larger with m more branching. But what happens is if this phenomena doesn't sustain and the cells stay uh, activated, it's going to form what we call astrogliosis and, you know, uh, scars. And that's not a good thing. Basically, it's going to kill cells around it. And that, this, this is the area in the brain, uh, the hippocampus, and this area of the brain is responsible for uh, memory and learning. And you can see there is a large, large number of cells that are activated. Same thing in the cortex to a lesser extent, but we still see activated uh, micro, uh, astrocyte. Then we measured acetylcholine uh, in the brain, and again, you see that in the brain of the mice that have been e uh, exposed, they have a higher uh, level of acetylcholine, and we think it's probably uh, a dysfunction that due to high dose exposure to acetylcholine inhibitor. Then we decided to do a proteomic uh, analysis, and we used two different techniques. And the reason we used two different techniques, because each technique has its, you know, give us some type of information, and one technique will give us uh, better coverage, while another uh, technique is going to give us a better uh, quantification. So we kind of combine both techniques. And basically what we do, we uh, take the brain from the control and expose, prep the protein, then digest the protein, then label them in this uh, case with a light and heavy uh, label. Uh, here we uh, label them with four different, we have the option to have four different, and actually with the uh, eye track we can go up to uh, 10 different label, then put the sample, then run them in a mass spec, and it, it gives us a quantitative analysis of what happened in the brain, basically. What are the proteins that overexpress? What are the proteins that are downregulated after exposure? So, and that gives us a lot of information, a lot of data that's mined by a, our uh, statistical, uh, statistical analysis team and mined the data and uploaded in a software called Ingenuity. And what Ingenuity does, it gave us basically a global picture of what's happening. Instead of looking at one single protein, it's going to look at networks. So, for example, if you look at here what's happening, you see, this is basically, th here the threshold is basically what's happening in normal brain. This is like the threshold for your normal brain. But if you look at, you know, the mice that have been exposed, you see like this, you know, pathway that are involved in neurological disease, psychological disorder, metabolism disorder, uh, infectious disease, inflammation. Uh, so all these networks are basically dysfunctional. There is a problem there. Then if we dig a little bit m m uh, deeper, we see like there's a mitochondrial dysfunction. And mitochondria is a powerhouse of our cell. If there's a dysfunction with mitochondria, it's not a good news in a way. So, and the oxidative phosphorylation, again, it's one of the pathway of uh, mitochondrial function and so on. So we went to then investigate, you know, what's happening in the mitochondria. And basically, cytochrome C oxidase activity is one of the, you know, the enzyme that uh, functional in the mitochondria. And you can see that in the PB permethrin exposed mice, we have much lower of uh, the cytochrome C uh, activity. Then uh, I'm just going to go back to those astrocytes. And uh, again, we looked at, this is just, you know, uh, over time, what's happening in the brain. And again, every time, you know, you see increase in uh, astrocyte active, uh, astrocytosis uh, in the brain over time. And, you know, it's sustained up to 22 months. So, what we decided is to start a treatment, a treatment uh, strategy using, an, because one of the components was inflammation and immune dysfunction, so the first thing we started uh, doing is 
trying to use an anti-inflammatory. So we use another bean. Another bean is a uh, tobacco alkaloid. Has, uh, we have done extensive work with it, and we showed that it has anti-inflammatory uh, functions. So we said, okay, let's see if we can improve the behavior. So what we did, we have four different group uh, exposed mice and then exposed mice with the, the treatment. And I have to remind you that what we did, we, did, we, we exposed the mice for 10 days, the same paradigm, let them age for five months until they start developing, you know, you know uh, neurobehavior uh, dysfunction, then we start treating them. There's no point on, you know, doing uh, preventive treatment because most of our military are already suffering from goal four. So as you can see, again, if you look at the control compared to the one that are exposed to a gold four agent, there is a problem in remembering where the, uh, that escape box was. But once we treat them with another being for 70 days, we almost bring that back to normal uh, level. This is just uh, two different tests. This is just looking at the average distance, and this is uh, uh, to the target area, and this is to the target hole. Basically, what we're looking here is we divide uh, the, the, the maze into four quadrants, if this, how much time they spend in the right quadrant and how much time it take, basically takes them to get to the maze and the distance it takes to get them to the maze. So this is just, again, uh, different, but every time you can see that we are bringing back you know, those mice that are exposed to almost to a normal level. And if we look at to, uh, in the brain, you see, again, this is the uh, the dentigerous uh, area, and this is your vehicle. This is the mice that, you know, just exposed to Gold 4 agent, and you see here the difference that we're reducing that inflammation in the brain. Same thing if you look at in the cortex. If you remember earlier, we had just a little uh, uh, astrogliosis in the cortex. It's almost inexistent in uh, the anatomy being treated mice. One other thing is we looked in this cohort is neurogenesis. Basically, neurogenesis is the birth of new neuron. There's very few area in the brain where we have neurogenesis. And one of the area is in the dentigerous, in the cortical layer. And basically, what that uh, does is the birth of a new neuron, but this new neuron also become functional and part of the network. And you see here this brown dot and this extension are new bone neurons. Then if you look at in the control, uh, and that being the same thing, but if you look at in the PB exposed, we don't see any new neuron born after exposure. However, if we treat our mice with anadabine, we, you know, we get back that neurogenesis functional. Yeah. Does it, is it something that the person has to take lifelong, or once the change is made, does it stay, or are you there yet? Um, to be quite honest, I don't know. We did a, you know, 70-day treatment, but we didn't do, we that we, basically it's something maybe we can explore is give them for 70 day, stop the treatment, let them age, and see what happens. Uh, you know, at this point we haven't done that, but it's not like an, you know, most people take anti-inflammatory, so it's not like, you know, an injection, it's oral. Actually, this was given in the water, so it's not like something continuous to take, even if we had to take it every day. Yeah? And you showed a, a dramatic functional response to the drug. I wondered if uh, in your biomarker analysis um, you looked at the blood level or the, um, or the, the level that might be in the spinal fluid for changes that could be effective uh, markers for astrocyte activation or neurogenesis? Uh, we did, uh, I showed the proteomic data in the brain, but we have done proteomic data in the blood, in the plasma. Uh, spinal fluid, it's really hard to get enough spinal fluid from a mice, and you know, uh, usually human also are not very thrilled if you ask them for a spinal uh, fluid sample. So if 
you know, definitely, basically, what, the, what this data tell us is, okay, how, here are the dysfunctions that are happening, and now we're working on how can we have a uh, biomarker panel that will, you know, easily accessible, we prefer to be, to be a blood, and, you know, look at that, those dysfunction. Have you been, uh, did you look at the undisclosed vaccines they had, a series of three doses that they gave to the? Well, it was, uh, most of the vaccine was cocktail vaccine, and as you know, you know, I don't want to be, uh, basically, even, you know, for pre bromide, no one know exactly how much they took. They gave them, you know, a blister saying, take it if you hear the siren. But if you are in a st that state of mind and you know there is a risk, there is a siren going on, you're going to start taking it more often just because you are scared. So in terms of vaccine, it's a cocktail. I don't know what cocktail they receive because they, don't, they haven't all received exactly the same thing. So it's really hard, and that's probably the problem with go for lack of information, what did they receive, how much they received, and how can we help. Hopefully this, you know, <coughs> what happened happened, but hopefully this will teach us and, you know, for it not to happen again. There was a, a series of shots that they took, and actually the shot record were actually telling them some of us got all three shots, mm -hmm. and then based on when we were deployed to, some only got two, and some only got one, and then this is a population that didn't get any. So it's kind of an interesting concept with that. Yeah, it's, you know, the, you know, the military usually is very shy disclosing, you know, what they gave and how much they gave. We wish we had that information because it will, you know, accelerate the process for us to understand what's really going on and what this information we got means and, you know, will help us kind of understand better. Most of your GIs, if they're been in the service for a while, they actually probably still have their shot. Yeah? Um, so I saw you use the Barnes Maze the a nice measure for people can't look at the medical behavior. Mm -hmm. Um, we we use water maze, but you know, usually mice don't really like water maze, right. yeah. uh, so it's really hard. So we had like to make a choice. We can there's a whole list of behavior tests we can do, but at some point you have to choose certain things and stick to them. If you wanna, uh, you, if you want a consistency we have to kind of decide, okay, we're gonna do this and stick to this because this is already giving us enough information. Yeah, we, we do like uh, object recognition. We, we, we do those type of uh, tests. Thank you. to thank everyone for coming here today to the VA um, open house at the Russ Camp Institute. Um, my name is Joseph Ojo and I'll be talking to you about post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, so I'm going to give you a brief background on what PTSD is and the relevance to the military health population. I'm going to talk to you about the current research studies we're doing here with respect to the clinical studies as well as animal studies. Um, I'm going to talk to you also about how the research we're doing is going to benefit the military population. And at the end, I'm going to talk to you about what you can do to help us further our research. So I'm sure you've probably heard some of these um, definitions today, but according uh, to the DSMV criteria, clinicians def define PTSD as a neuropsychological disorder that happens as a result of exposure to serious life-threatening uh, stressful events, such as exposure to uh, witnessing the death of a loved one, being exposed to serious injury, as well as sexual, being a victim of sexual violence. There are a cluster of symptoms that patients typically show. 
The first one is intrusion symptoms, which is intrusive traumatic recollection of the event that the person was exposed to. And then there's avoidance symptoms, which are it's defined as the social isolation. And also patients show negative alteration in cognition and mood as well. And finally, patients show alteration in arousal states. They typically transition from a hypervigilant state to a depressive-like state. And this cluster of symptoms have to be present for at least a month for you to see a clinical impact. I think this picture nicely depicts the different emotions that a patient goes through. And you can see some of them, fearfulness, uh, nightmares, the feeling of guilt, rejection, and self-blame. So with respect to the statistics and uh, the number of those who suffer from PTSD uh, in the military population, uh, statistics show that about 300,000 of those involved in the recent conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan uh, have been diagnosed with PTSD. Military suicides have been shown to be at the highest rate uh, for the last 10 years. And the national statistic shows that 20% of national suicide are a result of military uh, combat ve um, veterans committing suicide. In 2012, it was shown that military deaths were actually more than, uh, as a result of suicides, were more than the deaths um, experienced under life theater in, in the combat fields. So, this basically shows you that it's a serious health issue for the military population and healthcare. So the current research um, status in, with PTSD, uh, there's some challenges that we have, some hurdles we have to overcome. The first one is to do with the di proper diagnosis of PTSD, identifying sensitive and selective biomarkers or tools that can help us to um, detect PTSD early on before the patient shows negative symptoms. And it can be quite challenging as well when patients are exposed to a traumatic brain injury. They typically show overlapping symptoms with PTSD as well as heterogeneous symptoms. With respect to the therapeutic approaches used um, to treat PTSD, PTSD can be quite refractory and there are only a few options to treat it. And patients typically go into a phase of remission and relapse. This is a huge burden, obviously, on the healthcare. And as researchers, we need new biological perspectives to help us better understand PTSD to be able to treat it appropriately. Um, I put together this um, slide here just to give you a brief um, lesson on the neurobiological basis of PTSD. So if you look at the schematic diagram on the left, the fellow wielding the, the knife, you can basically um, swap them around as a per for a person who's just witnessed the death of a loved one or being exposed to a serious life-threatening stressful event. So this is our st stressful stimuli. What happens is that in a normal person, there are certain regions in the brain, as you see here on the right side, the hippocampus and amygdala, embedded in the deep part of the temporal cortex, and also certain brain regions in the frontal cortex as well. That, regulate, that store these traumatic memories and send signals to other parts of the brain. There is a, a gland in the brain called the pituitary gland, and this gland releases hormones once it senses the signals into the bloodstream. And once the hormones are in the bloodstream, they signal to another gland right above your kidneys called the adrenal gland. And that gland s releases more hormones into the bloodstream. So you have this storm of uh, hormones hanging around in the blood. And what happens is that it, these hormones are um, used by the body as a protective measure to regulate certain physiological functions, such as uh, heart rate, blood pressure, muscle contractility, and so on. And it's an intrinsic um, uh, uh, way for the, for the body to actually regulate that stressful event of flight and fight response. In a normal individual, this system will shut down after being exposed to this stressful stimuli. But in a person who suffers from PTSD, there's a dysfunction, a disconnect in this, in this circuit. 
And that's what we're trying to understand. So how do we do that? We do clinical research. So some of the work we've done has involved collecting, uh, looking at active duty soldiers pre and post deployment, collecting blood samples from those soldiers at those two different time points, looking at global changes in proteins, as well as lipids, and also looking at the genetic background to see what genes might confer resilience as, as opposed to um, susceptibility to having PTSD. Um, recently, we've been negotiating talks to obtain brain tissue samples from different parts of the brain that we can interrogate to look for biochemical markers as well as to examine uh, using our new pathological platform here some of the changes that goes on in the brain. This is quite exciting because we don't have a lot of brain tissue samples um, available to study PTSD from, from our veterans. And also we've been doing our uh, collaborating with some researchers that conduct uh, neuroimaging studies looking at changes in activities in different parts of the brain and how it can relate to some of those markers that we see in the blood. Um, another platform we have here is clinical research, um, doing studies in animal models. Uh, this is a work that I'm, uh, I've been involved with over the last couple of years. Uh, so we, you, we utilize um, uh, rodent models to use as a platform to understand uh, the neurobiological basis of PTSD. And we can expose them to different stresses that would elicit PTSD-like behavioral symptoms that we see in humans. And animal models are, are very good because we can uh, monitor them over a lifespan, which is a period of two to three years. We can genetically manipulate them to show a certain ph phenotypic um, trait that we're interested in. And uh, they're very easy to manipulate and cost um, effective. So some of the tests we do involves exposing them to different aversive stimuli, such as uh, physical trauma. And this is, this is a, a chamber that you see here. Uh, we place the animal in that chamber and we expose it to inescapable foot shocks. And also we can expose them to predator-like exposure, as you see here. This typically elicits an innate fear response in the animal. And also psychosocial stresses, which is an important aspect of PTSD because social behavior is something that PTSD patients show a lot. And also, traumatic brain injury as well. Uh, with respect to the different tests that we can do, uh, we can monitor certain behavioral traits in animals, uh, like Garnios mentioned about briefly for some of them. Uh, some of those tests involve tests for anxiety. Uh, as you can see here in this cross-shaped uh, plus maze, which has a closed arm here and an open arm. If you place a normal mouse into this um, plus maze, it will tend to go into the open arms and explore. Um, if, you place the if you place an animal that's anxious into the, open, into, the, into the maze, it will tend to spend more time in the closed arm, as you can see with this animal here. We have a test for depression, where we look at uh, the behavior of animals when we place them in this test called the force swing test. So basically we measure the time the animal spends being immobile or the time it spends struggling. If you place a normal mouse into this uh, container that's three quarters full, it would tend to struggle for quite a while, for a couple of minutes. But if you place an animal that's depressed into it, it will give up quick, quicker. And we can use the time uh, to the point where it stops struggling as a measure of depression. Um, we can also measure in this test here different um, social behavior between two uh, different an um, different animals in this three chamber test, as well as look at the sleep wake cycle, which is an important um, aspect of PTSD. So we have a repertoire of different techniques here that we can use at the Ruskamp Institute, uh, ranging from pathology looking at brain tissue sections, uh, looking at proteomic and lipidomic uh, analysis using the mass spectrometry, like Garnier briefly talked about. 
We can look at global changes, quantitative as well as qualitative, qualitative changes to proteins and lipids. And also we can utilize our techniques with respect to epigenetics, which is just a tool to look at changes and modification to DNA. And we can interrogate different biological um, materials um, ranging from blood samples to brain tissue from different brain regions, as well as peripheral organs like your adrenal glands. And so far from this study, we've been able to identify some important targets that we're hoping to um, explore in our animal models with respect to changes in lipids, as well as changes in certain hormones. And we have a grant right now that's been reviewed that we, we would like to use um, to explore some of those therapeutic approaches that we've identified. So the whole goal of this um, work that we do is to better understand the biological basis of PTSD to further our research. So what benefit we would get from our studies? Hopefully we're able to identify early biomarkers that correlate with PTSD. Um, it will facilitate early detection of the condition so we can intervene with appropriate treatments before that the patient show negative consequences. Um, also, to be able to identify new therapeutic strategies to treat uh, PTSD. So what can you do to help us with our research? You can visit our clinic and participate in our clinical studies, and you can give us details of your past history and donate um, some blood samples and biological specimens that we might require. So, and with that, I'd like to thank you for every single one of you for your service to the military. Thank you. You mentioned the military suicides in 2012 were higher than the actual number of deaths in combat. I, I think what's interesting is uh, a significant percentage of military suicides are for those that have never been deployed question I have is, is there a lot of research being done as it relates to age, education, and background of those military suicides versus the combat-related post-traumatic stress? There, there are some studies that are done, but it's very difficult, like Garnia said, to get together all the data and the, the different uh, demographics together. Because one, one of the things that, that happened uh, in the peak of the war is they changed the requirements on eligibility join the military. You didn't have to have a high school education. Uh, if you had a nonviolent misdemeanor of felony, uh, those things were waived to increase what was needed at the time as it relates to manpower requirements. So I think there's a correlation between uh, the education experiences and, educa and uh, background of folks uh, during that time frame versus the higher suicide rates. Yeah. Yes, but also you have to understand as well, with respect to PTSD, the, the stimuli that pe stimulus that people have to be exposed to can range. So it's not only experience on the, on the combat field. It could be as a result of um, whilst, whilst in the training setting as well, in non-deployment, so. All right, so good uh, morning, everybody. So this will be the last presentation for this morning. So I'm gonna try to make it uh, fun and quick. All right, so to start with uh, this presentation, you can interrupt me at any time, okay? Cannot be too rude to a Frenchman, so. Because <laughs> the, key, the key thing is we do those days to interact with you. Usually I sit in a lab and when I interact with veterans, you, they are on the slide, they are dead. So I need to do my research, it helps. If I interact with you, I know what's going on, what are the settings, what happened to you, so I can redirect what, what I've been doing, um, what I can do in research in the lab, and etc. etc. So to start with, uh, my talk will focus on traumatic brain injury. There is different type of traumatic brain injury. You have concussion, you have moderate, severe, blast injury, compressive injury, blunt injury. So how many of you guys 
had a traumatic brain injury, if you can raise your hand. So I see three, four people, five. Now you probably, I would say, there is more than five people in that room who had traumatic brain injury. So I'm going to try, the goal of this presentation is to explain to you in a general way what happened to your brain. So to start, the traumatic brain injury is a big problem for the military population. And uh, the VA is trying to tackle that issue with uh, different studies who have been triggered across the country. So this is not only a problem for the military, the US military, it's also a global problem because uh, TBI is affecting the military and the civilian, and it's global. And there is no treatment so far. We don't know what's going on in the brain. We don't know how to treat TBI. So that's why I'm going to try to give you a brief overview of what could happen in the brain and how we can treat TBI. So the Tampa VA is recruiting patients. You, can, you need to interact as much as you can with the different VA because they have studies. There's a lot of problem of miscommunication between the VA and also the veterans. They don't, there's a mistrust issue I can see. So please go and ask see if you can participate with different studies. You can ask Dr. Keegan, Dr. Hoffman. Uh, there is studies where you can be helpful for your future generation. So to start with, I want to give you, I want to show you that slide where you see a child who has an Eiffel Tower in the brain, basically. And what I'm trying to show you here is some type of brain injury are obvious like the Eiffel Tower, the child fell on a toy, an Eiffel Tower toy, so it can be dangerous, yes. And I got stuck in the brain, so what you do, you seek medical attention. Now if you get, uh, let's say you, you have the child, it fell on steps, but you don't see any bleeding, you don't see any sign of injury, you will not seek medical attention, maybe. You will say, well, I don't see anything, that's fine. But like Dr. Hoffman said previously, there is type of injury you can't see. And it's not because you cannot see it that there is nothing going wrong in the brain. And those are the silent injuries. So we have the technology to see. We don't have really the technology to see it. We have it, but the insurance are not going to pay it at this point. So it's not something who is going to come up soon, anytime soon. Mm -hmm. So it's not because you don't see any external sign of injury that your brain is not injured. In terms of... Uh, the um, statistic for traumatic brain injury, most of them, even in the military population, they are mild, considered as mild. So you don't have, uh, there is nothing like, you don't have skull fracture, you don't have hematoma, and people don't really consider that's the mentality. You, you don't see it, so you're not injured. So don't wait for the autopsy, because at the end, you will, what, what we have right now, we are collect, starting to collect the tissue from people who had a history of concussion, and we can see there is major change in the brain. And I'm gonna show you what's going on in the brain in the next few slides. So I have to say the NFL did a good job by trying to hide the long-term effect of uh, a concussion because they attracted a lot of media attention, and the media attention they brought help also the military, so it's kind of, it helps the research, we have more research bring from the VA on DOD to study the long-term effect of concussion, and this is all thanks to the NFL, who are hiding. So have, do, have you seen uh, the movie Concussion with Will Smith? Yes. yes. So this started with, everything started with uh, Bennett O'Malley, who did the, the autopsy of Mike Webster, and uh, we have tissue from, um, actually we have tissue from NFL player here, and we are looking, we are trying to make when we look in the mice, we're trying to see, does it, is it really what we see in humans? We don't want to do research that doesn't be, cannot be applied to human or clinical population. So we do, we look at in the mice and we look in humans and we see if it match, yes or no. So if you think at the brain, this is a pig brain and uh, the brain is like a jello, like a jello. And inside the brain, so think about the gray matter of the jello and then if you think about the white matter inside your brain as a, Squid, looks like squid. So if you, do an ac if you have a car accident, you have acceleration, deceleration, so you can see the brain who, you, wait, let me get the pointer. You can see how the structure stretch, but then it comes back to normal. 
when you, if you, unless you look at it under the microscope, you're not going to see the change usually. So I have a video to show you that process when, uh, let how many of you got a car accident? Much more? Yes. So let's see, this is kind of a, 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 a small video and it will show you, this is an axon who connect your neurons and inside those axons you have microtubules. So think about a highway. Neurons are cities and then you have uh, I-75 who connect those cities. And if you get a, a blast injury in a military setting or a car accident in a civilian setting, or if your child play football, you have acceleration, deceleration of your brain, and then you damage the structure. So think about the road where you have all those cargo molecules who move along the connection, the information, they get damaged and then it will break apart. So now if you do concussion after concussion or brain injury after brain injury, like during military training, you will damage those structure, and then if you do it for 10 years or five years or a longer period of time, the brain will start to, you will see an atrophy of your brain because you kill those neurons. If each time you get a small injury, you kill a neuron or two, and the cumulative effect leads to the brain to atrophy. And the main problem with also with TBI is, and I think, so the, what we call when you have a, before we go that, this is the injury when your brain has a concussion, acceleration, deceleration, we have what we call diffuse axonal injury. So those axons, what you have seen in the video, those roads, they get damaged. So if you look on the top, this is a, a female who died from cancer, no injury, so it's a control subject. You don't see any staining, it's, it's white, there is no problem. This is a traumatic brain injury, uh, a young individual, an 18 year old male who died 10 hours post assault. So think the fight. And you can see those axons, remember the video, that big road, the tunnel? This, you can see it start to stain in brown. So this is, this is a pathological hallmark of traumatic brain injury. If you wait for a little bit longer period of time, like let's say 18 hours post injury, you can see those beading process here, you see those little dots? Those are the axons because they broke, you damage those structure, and then it, it make like a, a car accident, a traffic jam. So all the more cargo molecules who move along those axons, they, they are jammed because the roads are broken. And it, you have a bidding process, 18 hours, and this is a mo motor vehicle accident. So anything we see in the civilian population can be applied with uh, military again. Again, this is a real axon. Remember the video, what you saw? This is an electron microscope picture. So we can grow axons in Petri dish. And then if we want to simulate a traumatic brain injury, we will change the pressure. It will stretch the axons. And what you can see in live what's going on. So you see the beading, if you remember the little dot, this is a real one. And you can see the black line here is a microtubule. But because it's mild TBI, some, because of the, the nature of the injury, not everything is damaged. So what you can think is, if your child, let's say, play football, he gets a concussion, you want to take him out from the field and let him rest. Because sometimes those injuries can recover themselves. Like this one, this, this microtubule is intact. So you have a swelling but give it a little bit of time and it might reduce the swelling and you might save your connection. But if you do, do that 100 times or 10,000 times, you will have 10,000, almost 10,000 more neurons in your brain than if you go back to play and then you will more likely damage and the damage will be forever. And this is what will happen to your brain. Like uh, the Dr. Hoffman or Dr. Keegan talked about the DTI. This is the brain network. It's a huge bundle of network in your brain. So this is a control subject on your left. And if you think about you receive multiple injury, this will, how your brain will look like. So now you have to think about the memory problem between Alzheimer and TBI is slightly different. There is a huge problem for TBI. It's a network synchrony who is the problem. Uh, we see a lot of people who have sleep disturbance, mood disorder. So if you can't sleep, then you, you get more angry. And then you, 
you cannot cope with real life. Uh, some people, they have also vision problem. They cannot concentrate. So the people who have TBI, they have problem of executive function. They can do a, a task, you ask them to do a task, but they, sometimes they will be slower to other people. This is because the whole network is damaged. So they can do it, but the road is not here anymore, so it takes a little bit more time for the brain to process the information. Now, this brings a lot of problem in terms of PTSD and TBI in the military setting, because if they, get, if they have mood disorder, they are married, for instance, um, they get angry with their wife, or the wife get angry with the husband. Sometimes also, if you work, uh, you, have, you used to do, uh, let's say you work at the institute, and you get TBI, then you cannot do your task as you used to do it. So if, if the work environment is bad, then they don't accept the change of your brain, they, you can get fired. If you get fired, you have problem with your wife and your family, and then what will happen, you might end up in the street because you lose your support from your work and the support of your family, and we see a lot of people who end up in the street like that. So it's very important that the family supports you, and you can thank them if they do. So what we do here, we did, um, I'm not gonna go too much in detail on the, in the research we're doing, but we try to mimic the long-term effect of traumatic brain injury, mild traumatic brain injury. So in science, we have to, we use animal model trying to replicate what could happen in a, in a brain in human. And uh, the beauty of that is because it's mice, we can sacrifice the mice at 24 hours or six, 12 or 24 months post injury because in human, when you get a concussion, you don't die. So we don't have any brain to compare what we see in the mice to humans. So we did publish an animal model. We did publish the research. We have, uh, this is the tool where we study um, traumatic brain injury. So it's a machine, it, it does impact the brain of the mice, it's a midline, and what happens is you don't see the effect of the injury unless you look under the microscope. And what we did, we looked at the effect of a single injury or five injury in three months animal, and then we looked at a whole full life course of the animal, so from 24 hours up to 24 months post injury. We looked at what are the effects of a single injury or five injury. And five years or six years ago, most of the people will say, like the NFL did, you get a concussion, there is no problem in your brain, there is no long-term effect, but there is long-term effect. And this is what we found out. And it correlates with the, what we see in humans now as well. So we collected blood for biomarker, we collect the brain for the pathology, we do lipid analysis, and we also do behavior analysis. On base of what we see, at all of those time point, we will look for drug or nutraceutical to try to change the time course of the brain. And uh, you're gonna go in lab tour in a, probably in after lunch, and you're gonna see Scott Ferguson, he's gonna talk about those treatment strategy. So what we found is there is ongoing damage, especially ongoing axonal injury and neuro, chronic neuroinflammation in the white matter of your brain. And so the treatment strategy is to reduce those inflammation and try to preserve the, the, the network in your brain. So this is what we are trying to do now. And we did publish in animal who have promising results. Now it has to be translated from the mice to the human. So this is a long process, as you know. So it will take a little bit more time. But we are working on it, so we just have to be a little bit more patient. What we did as well for TBI uh, in the military setting is uh, we collected blood sample for biomarker before deployment and after deployment. So, and then we are looking what are the, if you get a TBI or TPTSD, can we see any sign of that injury in, your, in a blood sample or urine analysis? So this is what we are doing as well, but this study is closed, so we are just analyzing the data at this point. So that's pretty much it for today. I'm not gonna go too much anymore in detail, but what we do, we study traumatic brain injury. We have the drug, and you will see when you do the lab tour, we have a chemic, you have a chemist who are designing drugs. So we just need to find, with the help of the mice, you have to thank those guys, what can we do to help and recover 
the brain after a traumatic brain injury. So then we apply those drugs in this animal, and if it's promising, we will translate that into clinical trial, and this is where Andy and Dr. Hoffman are here to, to do. So with that said, I would like to thank you all and for your service, and also thanks the family who support uh, all the veterans. And uh, that's it. If you have any questions. Yes. The study that just goes on the active duty blood samples. Yes. What numbers are we talking about as it relates to the total number of active duty? We're not talking about thousands. We're talking about hundreds. It's difficult to get. Uh, I, oh, I know it is. I know. So that's the problem we're trying to, to, to change. And the VA is also working on it so we can facilitate studies between uh, and communication between researchers and clinicians so we can have access to blood, brain, tissue, et cetera, et cetera. We have more brain tissue to tell you from the NFL, we have more like 100 or 200 brain. If we want to look in the military population, we have five, 10. There is a big mistrust. It used to be veterans used to give tissue well post-mortem. Now they don't anymore and uh, they had some litigation, but they used to have problems, so there is a still mistrust. And it's difficult to collect brain as well because people die, if, it, if nothing is set up, you have to contact the family, and uh, well, you know the, the drill. Yes? Um, have you found any correlations or associations between the TBI research and the the, in the mice, there is different, it's kind of interesting. We, we see effect, there is interaction between TBI and PTSD, yes. Um, somehow, well, Ojo can talk about that, but I don't know, he's gone. But yeah, there, there is, a, there is diff how do I say that? If you are exposed, PTSD, there is a phenotype in terms of behavior for the animal, and if you do PTSD on TBI, it's another phenotype in terms of you have different type of, of uh, behavior, basically, when you look at it. In terms of pathology, it's a bit different. You alluded to the long-term effects of traumatic brain injury, but you didn't really say anything about them. What are the long-term effects? Yeah. So what we see for the animals and what we see in humans, we have the white matter, the corpus callosum, who connect both hemispheres, we have a large bundle of uh, axons. This is damaged, and what we see in the animals is that once you get the injury, you have those beading process who occurs, it kind of ongoing. Whatever we see in the cortex recover, we don't see in neuroinflammation, we don't see too much going on, but anything in the white matter, and this includes the corpus callosum, the optic nerve, uh, the brain stem, it goes up to the brain stem. You can see an increased neuroinflammation, increased uh, astrogliosis. You also have a demyelination. You think about multiple sclerosis. You see you have the myelin around your, your, your axon, it disappears. So we don't know, it, it looks like when you get a TBI, there is this mechanical trauma who trigger the injury, and then it's kind of a loop process who fit itself. So you have axonal injury, neuroinflammation, the whole that part of the brain stay and remain inflamed for the whole life. So that's one of the, uh, the consequences. And then what you have, you have the corpus, because you have that inflammation and loss of myelin, you also have loss of axons, and then the corpus callosum will shrink. So you see the brain atrophy. Like I showed with the video, you can see, if you look at the, the CT case, the football player, also in the a, in a military, there is only a few case study. You can see the, some part of the brain who shrink like that. And those are the long-term consequences, what we see. Then uh, you can also have effect in terms of vision, because when you have acceleration, deceleration, your brain moves and also pull on the optic nerve. And when it goes through the skull, there is this part which is very sensitive. It, there is no room to move, and you have axonal injury as well here. And then that's why also you have people who have vision problem after TBI, because you have a loss of retinal ganglia cell. The blue cone, if you have a headache, let's say you look at the screen, 
you have a lot of blue light who is emitted. Those were very sensitive to the brain injury as well. So we see in veterans, it's not published, but we see changes uh, in terms of peripheral vision with veterans who have been exposed to blast injury and blunt injury. We can actually tell the difference between blast and blunt based on what we see in the eyes. Problem again, we have not enough sample to publish. So if you want to have a strong impact factor in the research community, you need to have, you don't want to publish with a few sample because it could be not realistic or representative of the clinical population. Thanks. Any other question? Yes. Well, like yes. for instance, um, my injury occurred as a result of an assault. Mm -hmm. And um, it was, it was um, said, like in the police report, it said that I hit the back of my head, yet all the damage was in the frontal temporal part of my brain, and there was no hard evidence to prove whether or not there was some, something else happened that was stated in the report or not. I never really got any answers, so I was curious what me falling on the back of my head. It could, yes, and I think you, uh, you have a lot of injury, and it's very complicated in terms of blast injury, especially in a military setting, I mean, or your case, because if you think about the blast, usually you have the blast wave. If you are in a Humvee, you will hit your head more likely because you don't have the seat belt. So it's multiple injury, and so you have the blast wave, you hit the head, so it's two injuries at the same time, and then sometimes also you have the projectile who will hit somewhere else, so you get three or four injuries, and if one, you have a, and when you fall, sometimes as well, you fall, so you hit the front, but the back, you can have a contre coup, and other parts of the brain are damaged as well. And the whole network could be also affected because of that acceleration, deceleration, and you have difference in terms of injury if it's, you have a frontal, and this is less, if you have an injury on the side, Sometimes, usually, it's more severe than if you have accident in the front and the back as well. There is a lot of things who are involved in terms of TBI. I don't know if if anybody want to talk about that or your injury. But yeah, you want to say something? Yeah, <coughs> thanks. It, it's a good point you raise. Um, you remember I showed you a slide that the frontal and temporal lobes are preferentially affected no matter where you get hit in the brain. So I think that's what you asked. And the reason for that is that the brain slots into the base of the skull. We'd have to show you a skull. And the, the temporal lobes and the frontal lobes are kind of anchored in the skull. So they can't move. The rest of the brain can wiggle about. So when you have a blast injury, it wiggles the brain. But those two lobes are anchored. And that's why they bear the brunt of the injury. And here's the important thing. In humans, that's the social, emotional part of your brain. And that's why we have the problems that we're seeing. And of course, we're not going to see that in mice. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Any other question? If not, I think uh, Jane want to say a few words. <laughs>